Faraz Kamani is editor of a specialized healthcare journal in England and is also personally involved in the stock market. He is an active small shareholder. For him, owning and trading shares is a way of saving for the future and earning extra income occasionally. I think it started with the big boom in the uh, 80s when everyone in Thatcher's Britain found out what shares were about. Uh, we never knew that before. I think my mother and father bought them for the first time and we were in a sense, I suppose, signatories because you could buy them at the age of 16, I believe. And you simply had to get your children to sign them and your father and mother would take care of them for the appropriate amount of time until you could actually sell them. So um, at that time, we had our first shares, really. Kermani grew up with this kind of investment. As Britain restructured, he stuck with it, in spite of sometimes worrying fluctuations. There was a time when I invested in a firm called British Biotech, which was um, plugging this great anti-cancer drug at one point. And we all thought it was going to do very well. And then certain things went wrong with the company. I believe there was some mis mismanagement. And as a result, the shares absolutely collapsed. They went from something like four pounds to 23p or some, something in the region of that. And my view on that is very, very simple. If you don't sell, you don't lose. On the other hand, a good speculative judgment can provide some extra income when it is needed. For example, a few years ago, I bought shares in the toy store, Hamleys. The reason being, Christmas was coming, Hamleys was on a low, I think, during the summer, and I thought the shares were severely undervalued. I wanted to make some extra money for Christmas. I uh, bought them in June, sold them in September, and made £350. And I think that was a very, very good return. A new EU harmonization directive on transnational shareholders' rights is currently under development in the European Parliament. Creating legislation which is citizen-friendly across the EU is a top priority in Brussels, and shareholders' portfolios are becoming more international. Owning shares is different depending on where you are, a Parliament legal specialist explains. At present, we have a paradox. Shareholders' rights are extremely different from one member country to another. The conditions can even be discriminatory towards shareholders from a different EU member state. This is making potential investors within the European Union think twice when looking to place their money outside their own country. That is supposed to change. We want capital markets in Europe to be more far-reaching and more effective. That's only going to work if we make transnational investment easier, and a part of that is to harmonize transborder shareholders' rights. Ever since the successful introduction of the euro, it has been possible to make investments within the eurozone without the risk of exchange rate volatility. Before the euro, that sort of security had only been possible while staying within a national currency. Small shareholders, individual consumers in other words, may also profit from gains in choice today. A European Parliament expert on the new legislation welcomes the reform, therefore. There's consensus among the Socialists, the Liberals and the Christian Democrat groups. We're fully in favour of a democracy of shareholders to enable them to exercise their right to vote and give them access to the information they need before and during general shareholders' meetings. There's also a fundamental consensus between the three groups to develop democratic practice within company structures. Within the Eurozone, Germany demonstrates the most respect of shareholders' rights. Even the owner of a single share in a listed company has a vote, plus the right to pose questions at general meetings and raise points for debate. Both the key guides for the legislation in the European Parliament are German. They are also familiar with the problematic side of this kind of shareholders' democracy. In Germany, Indeed, I have to admit, and I have experienced it myself a couple of times, I've seen very well-informed shareholders, even though they have very few shares in their portfolio, who try to act against the management of the company. History shows that they are very frequently successful in this. The rapporteur of the Committee for Economic and Monetary Affairs only entered politics two years ago after a business career. As an entrepreneur, he lived in several European countries. This gave him up close experience of different aspects of globalization. 
Since 2000, the EU has been increasingly concentrating on a two-fold approach to globalization challenges, building a real common market for goods and services on the one hand, and developing democracy and social responsibility on the other. The Capital Markets Benchmark Transparency Directive, passed just under two years ago, is currently being put into national law by the member states. Lobbyists for small shareholder interests much appreciate this approach. The General Secretary of the Confederation of European Shareholders Associations, Euro Shareholders, believes these values are vitally important in company boardrooms. It's often thought that the shareholder should be satisfied with a tiny dividend and keep quiet. When a merger brought about a windfall, the shareholder was happy. But there were others who seized the opportunity to fill their pockets in a way that looked like stealing in some cases. We cannot continue to have market mergers, operations which increase economic concentrations, without really taking into account the interests of the investors and consumers and even the personnel, because all those interests are tightly interlinked. The electronic revolution, however, has also provided vastly increased opportunities for every individual. The content of the directive proposal under discussion includes abolishing all forms of share blocking, removing obstacles to electronic participation in shareholder meetings, defining and allowing proxy or postal voting, providing relevant information beforehand and later publishing the voting results. Kermani only owns shares traded on his national stock exchange, but he feels strongly about the European single market's evolution. You have to break down the borders. There are certain things that are going to be more difficult to break down than others, and I appreciate that financial services is one of them. But this is seriously, I think, to the detriment of people and certainly investors and certainly looking long term to things like pension firms, etc., or bridging the pension gap. We need to have free movement of goods and services. Central to the directive is broadening the scope for citizens to choose how they build their own future. <laughs>